Hey everyone, this is Laura Bush, Senior Park Naturalist with Hunter County Division of Parks and Recreation. I'm here today at Uplands Reserve, which is one of our county parks in Raritan Township. We're going to do a little nature walk to see what's out today. The way that this park is accessed is through Bernadette Morales Nature Preserve, part of Flemington Raritan Parks. It's on Kapner Street in Flemington. So here's our first stop. This is one of my favorite reasons to come here to this preserve. And here we have a native wildflower called Virginia bluebells. This is a native flower. It was probably originally planted here along the driveway to Uplands Reserve. The scientific name is Mertensia, which was named after a German botanist, Franz Karl Mertens, in the 17 and 1800s. If you take a look here at these flowers, they are blue when they're fully mature, but you'll notice that the buds are actually pink. And this is an indication that it's not ready to be pollinated yet. When the flower is ready, it's going to turn blue. And you can see here, these guys are ready to be pollinated. Now they're often pollinated by butterflies. And after the flower has been pollinated, it will fall off. Right here, you'll notice one that has fallen off. And over here as well. There's some that have fallen off up there. And that's basically a way to ensure that only the plants that are ready to be pollinated will be pollinated. Once they're ready to make seeds, the flower itself falls off. One of the great things about this flower is that it is deer resistant. Although it's native, it's not really found in the wild too many places. It's often in places like this where it's been planted in the past, but it is a nice flower to plant at your house. Amongst these bluebells, we are going to see some other wildflowers. These are spring beauties, which is one of our native spring flowers. It does flower usually by the end of March, but sometimes all the way up through early June. And you might be familiar with this, it sometimes even grows on our lawns. But it's a white flower with typically five petals and little thin pink lines down toward the center. Now those lines are going to guide the bees and other pollinators right down to the pollinating parts right in the middle of the flower. You can see right there where all that yellow is right in the middle. Yellow violets are another type of wildflower that are out here. Now violets are not always purple. They can be yellow, sometimes white. Let me just scan around here and you can really see how many bluebells there are just carpeting the ground on both sides of the trail. Now this is really cool. I've actually never seen this before. There is one flower that has white flowers instead of blue, which is pretty neat. And actually, there are more than one. Let's pan over here. Two, there's a couple over there as well. It's pretty interesting. It's probably just a genetic difference in this individual where it doesn't have the same pigments in the flowers as the regular ones do. There's a male northern cardinal in the center here. There he is calling. He's attempting to establish his territory from other males and also attract a female. There's a cabbage white in with these bluebells. It actually just pollinated one. This is one of our most common butterflies. See it floating around there. It's actually one of our butterflies, one of the few butterflies that we have that is not native. Originally from Europe. Um, it was brought here probably by accident because it does lay its eggs on cabbage plants. 
and uh, other similar plants in that same family. So these bluebells and other spring wildflowers, they're called spring ephemerals. Uh, ephemeral means short-lived, and obviously spring, it blooms in spring. So these are plants that come out in spring and only bloom for a short period of time. They're basically taking advantage of the extra light that's coming through the trees this time of year. As we look up, most of our trees are not yet leafed out and that allows most of the light from the sun to hit the forest floor this time of year. When we get later in the summer, when all the trees are leaved out, actually at least 90% of the light from the sun does not actually hit the forest floor. So wildflowers don't have um, an easy go of it if they want to bloom in the woods later in the summer. So they bloom in the spring to take advantage of that extra light. Now we're getting to the historical part of the walk. Right here, this is the ruins of one of the houses that was on this property originally. This one here was a smaller house that was a rental that was sublet out to tenants. There would have been a nice view over the hill before these trees had grown in. Here's a really neat old maple tree with a big hole in the middle. This type of hole could be a home to many creatures like raccoons, opossums, woodpeckers, uh, flying squirrels perhaps. Here's a patch of violets and the violet is the state flower of New Jersey. It's pretty small, uh, usually purple, but as we saw before they could be yellow or sometimes even white. There are several different species of violets and they have a distinctive heart-shaped leaf. There's a morning cloak butterfly. Morning cloak is a brownish butterfly with yellow on the edge. It's not that exciting to look at, but it has a little bit of yellow, some blue spots on the inside of its wings. It's spelled M-O-U-R N-I-N-G, morning cloak, and it um, kind of represents uh, someone with a colorful dress on, a yellow and blue dress with a brown cloak over top as if she's mourning the death of a loved one. This is one of our earliest butterflies. Um, we usually see this one in March. It actually can hibernate or migrate short distances depending on the severity of the winter, but It'll find somewhere to hibernate, like under bark on a tree or under dry leaves on the ground. That's one of the many reasons why it's important not to throw out those dry leaves, but maybe just to find a spot on the edge of your yard where you can store them so that butterflies, moths, other insects can overwinter there. We're now looking at the ruins of Uplands Estate, which was the main house on this property. This was the home of Judge George Large and his wife in the 1930s. Judge Large was one of the lawyers for the prosecution in the Charles Lindbergh trial. This was the uh, trial in 1934 called the Trial of the Century. It was the trial of Bruno Hauptmann for kidnapping and murdering the son of Charles Lindbergh. There are several ruins on this property. There's, uh, there was a barn here. We had a guest house. The main home, some chicken coops and other outbuildings. And Charles Lindbergh actually did stay here during the trial in the 1930s. He and his family wanted to avoid the press so they were shuttled around to many different locations. Um, and he actually stayed here on his 33rd birthday in 1934. You might recognize this plant. It's pretty common. Many of us might consider it a weed. It's called garlic mustard. It has small flowers with four petals. Um, the leaves are kind of elongated, pointed, toothed, and the leaves are actually edible. 
They are better when the plant is younger. This is a two-year plant. It's a biennial. It lives for two years. The second year it looks like this. And the first year it just looks like that. Just right down there on the ground. Um, they are better to eat when they're younger. And you can make pesto using them. Uh, when they get older they get a little more bitter and um, not quite as good like that. But the seeds are also edible later in the summer. This plant though, it is an, an invasive plant. It's all in here. You can see several of them. It does tend to take over areas. The seeds spread rapidly. But the reason that it was brought here, there's a chipmunk. The reason that it was brought here was by settlers as a garden plant, as an herb. But it has pretty much escaped and it is very common now in our area. I've got a mini kettle of turkey vultures here. A kettle is an area where there's warm air that allows the birds to rise up, which is important when birds migrate. These are native birds to this area year-round, but it is does seem to be a good day for migration for hawks and other raptors. I have seen several hawks throughout the day so far. Uh, the turkey vultures, they have a red head that is just skin. It's no feathers on it. And although we might think it makes them look ugly, they are an important bird because they eat dead animals. And that's very important so that they help us clean up when things pass away. That um, head without any feathers is a great adaptation for their lifestyle because it helps keep their face clean when they're eating those dead animals. The uh, skin is much easier to clean than the feathers. Here's the ruins of an old truck. You can see those trees growing right out of it. Those trees are younger than the truck. So the truck was there and then the trees grew through it. In the background is the wall that was part of the barn for this property. This is a flowering dogwood tree. Many of us plant these as ornamentals, but they are native. The flower is actually in the very center of those white areas. Those white spots are actually bracts, which are basically a uh, modified leaf. So right there in the center, it's really just buds right now. They are not yet open but in there would be where the actual flower would be. And dogwood trees are important for wildlife. They have berries that are beautiful in the fall, but those are also important food sources for migrating birds. Here's some damage from a pileated woodpecker. The holes that are taller than they are wide, those are from the pileated. This is a 16 inch bird with a red crest, the woody woodpecker bird. And they are looking for insects, especially carpenter ants, inside these trees. Um, another thing that they do is you make the holes in order to build a nest. This one is not deep enough for a nest, but this is the time of year when birds are starting to think about their nests. We have some deer tracks here in the mud. Deer have two toes, and it kind of looks like an upside down heart bottom of the heart is pointed out. That's the direction that they're going. It actually looks like there's two feet, two footprints right on top of each other here. And they are following this human trail. One thing that's interesting is that wildlife will use established trails that people have created, um, just as we do, just because it's easier than walking right through the woods. These are some of my favorite trees. They're called tulip poplars. They're nice and tall and straight. And right now their leaves are just coming out, but when they're mature, they will look kind of like a tulip, kind of like a cat's head with two ears on the top and the whiskers in the corners. They have four lobes on their leaves. They also, in May, around Memorial Day, they're gonna have flowers on the tops of the trees that are yellowy, green, pinkish in color. Very pretty. 
This is another neat spot. These are sassafras trees. Even though their leaves aren't open yet, you can tell they are sassafras because of their curly branches. Sassafras have three different shaped leaves on the same tree. It's pretty neat. You have the football shape like this. You have the mitten and then the ghost or the dinosaur footprint, which is like this, all on the same tree. And the leaves are edible. They can be dried and ground and put into soup as a thickener. Um, also there, you can use the roots to make a tea. However, it might be kind of difficult to pull up the roots of these big trees. We're entering a spot that is much darker. That's because it does have evergreen trees in it. This is the cedar or juniper or eastern red cedar tree. And this is a successional species, which means it's one of the first species to come in once a field is left abandoned. These trees come in and then other trees will come in eventually and replace them. But for right now, they're making a little bit of a forest cover here for us. There's a little stream that's crossing the trail here with the spring rains. I want to take a look at this plant right here. This is a plant called jewelweed. And when it rains, water droplets will bead up on this plant. Let me just pick one leaf here to show you what we're talking about. Get a little water. See how silvery that looks? The water will bead up. That happens because there's little hairs on this leaf that sort of repel the water. Um, it's a great plant to know. It's got sort of this scalloped edge. Um, this is a plant that can be very useful if you ever get poison ivy. You can just grab this plant, pick the stem, and rub the juices from the stem onto your poison ivy, and it should help with the itching. It also gets an orangey flower with, a, with spots on it that kind of hangs down like an open mouth, and it's called spotted touch-me-not or jewelweed. The touch-me-not name comes from the fact that it has seed pods later in the summer that are big and green, and when you touch them, they explode, scattering the seeds in many different directions. It's not poisonous or anything. Um, it is a very common plant. As you can see, it's all along here, along the stream, so you don't really have to feel too bad about picking it for poison ivy. Here we've got some May apple, which is one of our other early spring wildflowers. Looks like a tiny umbrella. When you get one, one stalk that has two different umbrellas here at the split, that's where it's going to flower. It's a little early still, should be flowering in a couple weeks, and then it will make a little greenish apple looking fruit. It's used in je jellies and jams, but it's also poisonous in some stages, so something you don't want to mess around with. Plus, it would take quite a bit of these fruits to make a jelly. Just a little look down into Walnut Brook that we can see here from the trail. 